Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for everybody who participated in our uh, kind of bootleg survey I uh, got going on there. Uh, on the plus side, the fact that I don't see any zeros means I'm assuming everyone does have a uh, Wireshark installed um, or knows how to get it installed. So uh, we won't have to deal with trying to figure that out, hopefully, uh, too much. If we do, it's all good. Um, so let's get started. All right. So this is demystified computer networking hands-on approach. Um, though in hindsight, after having drafted all the slides together, I've realized that a hats-on approach is a better uh, term perhaps uh, for what we're doing here. I'm Sam, uh, I'll be your presenter type of person uh, for today. A little bit of background about me. Uh, I joined the Air National Guard as a network admin in 2017, so just past my five-year mark there. Um, I've done a few different things with them, um, been a few different places. A um, little, you know, little bit of everything there. Uh, I do stuff with systems, servers, automation, networking, I'm um, a Sec Plus instructor uh, at Drill. We do a little Sec Plus seminar for our comms guys uh, who are coming into the unit every uh, every month. And on the civilian side, I'm a cyber researcher, uh, not not an expert. Um, what that means, though, uh, is is something that I I, I like to think and I hope is going to be an advantage because the idea, the goal with this uh, this chat, this discussion, was to work with people who are, you know, bare minimum. Um, looks like we got a mix of experience here. So that's actually pretty cool. Um, maybe we'll be able to learn from each other a bit. But uh, I, I think there's a problem where when you, you get too, too smart, sometimes you forget um, what the fundamentals were uh, or, or how you learned the fundamentals. Um, and hopefully uh, not being an expert will actually come to our advantage uh, for that today. So we'll see how that goes. Um, so, uh, introduction to you uh, is, is also something I'm hoping for. Um, so we got a little bit of information here um, with everybody's networking background. Um, it looks like we've got a decent sized group. So I'm, I'm not going to do one of those like, hey, everybody, uh, you know, do a little icebreaker or things like that. Uh, we'll just we'll just keep it pretty, uh, pretty relaxed. Uh, but keep in mind, uh, especially if you're new to VetSec, that uh, this whole place, everything uh, here is designed for the facilitating um, not just computer networking, right, which is this this lab, but human networking, which is what the 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 reality of um, any job uh, that you're going for is going to need a lot of human networking, uh, and human networking is going to be probably the best thing you'll get out of being in VetSec or coming to VetSecCon. So. Um, Talk to you know your, your your classmates. I don't know if that's the right word. Uh, fellow attendees um, utilize our uh, career fair and utilize the uh, the other uh, options and networking options that uh, Hopin has for us because uh, they're really they're really cool. Um, and yes, ho hoping for the workshop is to take you guys from uh, wherever you're at, whatever number you guys put out for networking and Wireshark, and just move that up like 0.5, but more specifically. Um, to not just move you up the 0.5, but to give you the ability to see how you can move yourself up further than that. So this is not going to be a workshop about um, that that teaches you all that much. And for some of you guys, we you might not learn much at all. Um, but the goal is to teach you how to teach yourself a little bit about networking, especially if that's something that seems opaque to you, which is in my experience has been uh, pretty common uh, for IT people um, and software people and just, just people in, in tech in general is that uh, networking seems really esoteric. Um, so why do we wanna learn networking though? Why does it even matter? Uh, and that's a great question. Uh, everybody nowadays likes to talk about the cloud, right? And moving, moving everything away, you know, abstracting stuff away. Uh, the reality is that there's still a lot of jobs that require people to go in and actually 
uh, work on routers and switches and things like that. And even with the, the, the new paradigms that are, people are using with software defined networking and things like that, um, you still need to know networking in order to uh, actually get data from me to you. And what that looks like is going to be different nowadays or 10 years from now. Uh, but it's still at the end of the day, you need to figure out how these packets are going over the wire and through the complex machinery that is the internet and, and getting to the person at the other end so that they can look at the cat meme that you sent them. And if you don't figure out how to do that, well, somebody's, somebody's got to know how to do that, right? Uh, I, I've talked to a lot of people who have had networking questions on technical interviews, especially for uh, like SOC jobs. It seems like, um, and in my job in particular, and like I said, I, I work in research, I do uh, software development. Um, we like to ask people questions like, uh, what's the difference between a MAC and an IP address? And uh, these are important questions because they, they show that you understand the, the, a common design pattern in computers. Uh, which is this design pattern, which we're going to talk about, which is really the only thing we're going to talk about theory wise before we get to our lab, uh, which is encapsulation is the magic word. So our lab tools, we've got Wireshark, uh, we've got Netcat, and we need uh, you, 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 you to be curious. If you're not curious, also, you might not want to be in this field. Um, I, I, not, 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 not anything against you, but this is a field for curious people, uh, people who like to learn. So uh, if you do, then great. You, you're, you might be in the perfect field. Uh, real quick, anybody who wasn't here when I had it up, up earlier, um, is there anyone whose experience with Wireshark in particular is a zero um, or uh, like at, on a scale of one to 10, uh, just put like, or zero to 10 where zero is you, you never even you know, turned it on. Um, how, how much experience do you have with Wireshark? You'll see, I also asked the earlier people networking in general, but we're, we're just, just specifically Wireshark where we're looking at right now. Okay, we got two, four. This is great. I, I see myself as like a 6.5 with Wireshark. So far, I haven't seen anything higher than that. So it's like, whew. <laughs> Wait, was there, was there one that was higher than 6.5? Oh, there we go. Well, Nicholas was pretty close. Okay, sweet. Um, nice. Okay, so the, that's, that's again, this is great because it means that everybody has at least opened Wireshark and kind of knows what it is. And I don't need to be like, well, this is what Wireshark is. Though so, uh, we will do like some basics on that um, in case anybody just, just to get the standard uh, terminology out of the way. So what we're going to do in the lab. Now uh, we're going to talk about network traffic. We're going to talk about how network traffic is just hats. That's all it is. It's hats. Uh, then we're going to dig around in Wireshark. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah, I haven't gotten around to the CTF yet. So we'll uh, hopefully I'll be able to do that after um, after the presentation. Um, so you, yeah, you guys might already be would be Wireshark pros uh, at this point, <laughs> past anything I'm doing. Uh, and then there's there's a what I was originally calling a post lab capture the flag. Um, so what I'm going to do, because we do have some people here who, who I think probably are, are fairly advanced, uh, and, and, and know more than just, uh, you know, what, what a PCAP is in the discord, I am going to put, uh, the, the, the fourth PCAP. So the first three are just kind of, we're going to do those in the, in the lab. We're going to talk about, you know, what what's actually going on under the hood. Um, but the fourth one is one that I built uh, with a different idea, which was we're not going to build that one out because it actually took uh, it was a slightly complicated um, thing to get running. But let me just find it. Give me one second, please. All right. So I am posting in the Discord, and if anybody's not in the Discord, uh, there should be a workshop. Uh, or if you're not in the Discord, let us know, and somebody will be able to drop you that link. 
So this is um, this is like a, a CTF esque. Let's see if I have it saved in my. All right, yeah. So if you go to Discord um, and you go to that link and you go to the workshop section, there are uh, four PCAPs in the demystify uh, networking. There, the first three are just in case you can't get netcat working and you, you, you want to follow along, but you can't do it. The one that's challenge.pcap is a capture the flag PCAP. Uh, so that one is if you get the flag, and it shouldn't be too hard, but it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, and you you send me the flag on LinkedIn, uh, I will send you a meme. Uh, I unfortunately do not have greater incentives than that, um, but I will send you a meme uh, if you if you send me the the flag for the challenge PCAP. Oh, so that's your that's your incentive. So the purpose of that again is if we start getting um, if we're going over something and you as an individual find that it's it's too simple or you don't like you already know this very very well. Uh, feel free to dig into the PCAP. Um, if you solve that in like three minutes, uh, you, you should probably go into the other uh, the other seminar because you're going to get more of that. Uh, but again, this is this is basic stuff. Um, uh, I don't think the challenge uh, PCAP is is super difficult if you if you know what you're doing, uh, but it's designed to be a little difficult if you don't know what you're doing. Um, and hopefully, an opportunity to learn a few different things about networking and about Wireshark. Uh, so that's what we're going to do. So let's let's dig into our first topic, which is how network traffic is just hats. So so one of the key things in in anything with computers is you cannot just throw data at people. If you try to do that, uh, or sorry, at other computers, uh, people seem to think uh, that computers are smart. I, I assume most of you uh, smart people in here know the truth, which is that computers are incredibly stupid. Uh, they are fast. Uh, they are stupid fast, far faster than anything uh, that humans can do, but they are very stupid. If you don't tell the computer exactly what to do, it is not going to do it. So you have to give it some kind of way to control that data. And the in, in networking, that is traditionally using encapsulation. Uh, and all that is a very long and scary word, especially if you're not comfortable with with networking, right? Encapsulation sounds scary. I mean, it's it's a fairly uh, known word. I think people typically know what it means, and just to put something in a capsule, right? Like a time capsule. But if you don't uh, know what it means, that can be weird. Uh, all it is is a hat. It's a hat. It's a hat that your data wears, just like a hat that you wear. Uh, let's talk about hats. So, so a hat is, is not you, right? You're, you're a person, uh, unless you're an, a super intelligent AI who has uh, snuck onto VetSec and is uh, using this as an opportunity to take over the world, uh, in which case, I uh, hope I'm on your good side. Uh, but you can wear a hat, and the hat says something about you. This hat that I'm wearing right now, uh, when I first uh, when I took on this current job, uh, it, somebody noticed that I... Uh, it was a military-ish hat, and they asked me when I served. You know, had a little conversation with them about it uh, because the hat said something about me. Um, and if I were to put on a different hat, if I were to take this other hat and put this one on, uh, it says something slightly different. It's it's a very similar hat, uh, but this one says that uh, I was. Just, it might be a bit of a, a stretch to know this automatically, um, but this one is because I was in the Air Force during the ABU era, and and I got it with my ABUs. Uh, and you wouldn't know that I also have been in the OCP era if I had that hat covering it. Uh, and if I swapped them out, like so, it's the other way around. You only get to, you only see one little piece of information about me at a time. And it's information about me, again, it's not me. So, so what does that actually mean? That's a great question. Uh, well, let's take a little circuitous route 
to get back to answering that question. We're going to do a, a hypothetical scenario where we pen test VETSEC. There's four gates and there's four guards. And I'm going to need you guys to, to give me some suggestions on how we're going to social engineer these guys uh, and uh, get to our target, which is a laptop that uh, the, the VETSEC chief executive officer has. And we, we got to plug a, a USB into it. Uh, so I have built out a diagram. Uh, it took me a long time to figure this out. Uh, I'm not very good at diagrams, so here we go. Now, can anyone tell me some information we can glean about the first, uh, the first security guard we have here on the left? Um, any any information we might be able to use to to get past that person? likes expensive hats looks navy on the left that's navy hold on maybe uh maybe i can zoom in a little bit here let's try this actually one second please Minor technical difficulty. All right, well, that's not working, unfortunately. So go back to it. Um, I'm going to say this guy on the left has an Air Force hat on, uh, though actually, mm, I might be wrong. And then the middle guy, uh, I think that's an army hat. Then we've got a Navy guy right here. That's definitely a Navy hat. And then we got a Marine hat. So if we were to try to get past these guys, um, well, something we could do is, is put on a similar hat, right? To try to get through each of their little, um, to, to ingratiate ourselves with them maybe, and, and to move along and get to the laptop over there on the side. Uh, this is a stupid, stupid example, right? Um, but the hats do say something about the people. And those hats are analogous to headers uh, and, and also footers. We'll, we'll talk about those in a minute. But, but headers are the key to, to really anything with networking. Uh, at, at the end of the day, your data, um, which is the actual stuff you care about, right? The, the contents of your email, the contents of your voice traffic, the contents of whatever you're, you're trying to get across that network, those cat pics, um, whatever, they can't get there by themselves. So they need control data information saying, this is where it's going, where it's coming from. Uh, this is how it's getting there. That all is in the header. And as it turns out, uh, computers work better when you give different computer functions only one job at a time because computers are, again, not very smart. So instead of having all that information in one hat, you put it into a whole lot of hats, a whole lot of different headers. And if you're really trying to understand what your computer is doing uh, on the network level, you got to look at look through those headers. Uh, and, and then socks being footers, it turns out that uh, sometimes you can't just put a hat on the data, you have to put socks on the data. So the header would be data that or information about the data that you put in front of it. And a footer is information about the data you put behind it. So I'm going to take off both my hats now, uh, because it's a little bit warm in here. And uh, let's talk a little bit about the actual hats that your data wears. And again, this is, these are stupid examples, right? So, so chances are uh, you're going to remember this workshop as, oh, that the, the workshop where the dude just talked about hats instead of talking about cybersecurity or talking about IT. Uh, that's actually something that we're going for here. I have found that stupid examples tend to stick in people's minds better. So 
uh, if we're going to try to figure out uh, how to get people uh, a baseline understanding of networking, uh, I'm going to go for the stupidest example I can think of. So, so there's three, three main hacks because there's three types of devices that are the base devices in networking. There's a switch, there's a router, and there's a host. Uh, if you uh, have ever set up your home computer network, there's a good chance you've got a switch and a router packed together into one device, and then you've got your host, the computer you're watching this on right now. Uh, those are three separate devices, essentially. Um, the switch is, is your local traffic. Uh, and that traffic has, a, has its own unique address saying how to get where it's going. And that address is called a MAC address, which you may or may not have heard that term before. And the hat that it wears that holds the MAC address is called a frame. Uh, a router says how to get things from one network to another network. And that has a IP address, which uh, I'm sure almost everybody, if not everybody, has is familiar with. And that hat is called a packet. And, th and then the one that I think is the, probably uh, talked about less and, and, and tends to get glossed over in a lot of basic networking classes is, is the port. Uh, and a port number, some of you guys who play video games might be familiar with port forwarding, things like that. Your port is the address, um, not just to the host itself, because the host has an IP address and a MAC address, but more so where, where on the host you're trying to get to. Because you'll you notice you guys probably have, uh, if you're like me, I've got Discord running, I've got Slack running, I've got Visio running, I've got uh, you know a, a virtual machine running. I've got a bunch of different computer things running, and all of these are talking to the network. And the computer has to know past just the IP address of like, this is this is who I am, but like, where on my computer is all this stuff going? And if it doesn't know that, uh, does a computer know how to find out, figure out where anything goes if you don't tell it exactly where it goes? No, computers are stupid. They're just fast. So the port is, is the address related to the hat that the host wears uh, on the segment level. And just like this, the stupid example earlier, earlier, where I put on two hats, your data is wearing at least two hats at any given time. And it's really wearing three to way more than that. Uh, Cause it's wearing a frame hat. It's wearing a packet hat. It's wearing a segment hat. And then everything else below that um, is either is more hats until you get to your actual data. And this is the key. This is the key, in my opinion, to understanding networking. TCP IP or the OSI model are things that a lot of people get taught. And I think they're good. They're good things to learn. But the, the crux of the idea in networking, and, and this is a general computer science idea, is that your data has one job and all the information about your data has a different job. How to get the data to where it's going, where the data is going, uh, when it needs to be there, things like that all get segmented out into different hats. And if you can understand one hat and you can research about one hat, that is all you're gonna need to build up and understand a complex system. Because if you break it down into its hats, you're gonna be able to figure out what every individual piece is doing. This takes a lot of time. It is not necessarily fun. But when you can actually break it down into its individual components, uh, it becomes very straightforward, uh, relative, in my opinion, to a lot of other things in computing, uh, where they're all kind of doing that. But with networking, uh, it, it's a little easier to be straightforward. And with Wireshark in particular, which is why we're doing a Wireshark lab here, uh, you'll see that it's, it's, it's literally like a visual hat uh, system. So we're going to do that. So what we're going to do right now is actually take a quick break. Yes, David, that is exactly what it is. And what you're doing is you're adding hats on top of hats. And then when you move the other direction on the OSI model, you're taking the hats off. 
That's that's all there is to it. So so what we're gonna do um, is we're gonna take a break. We're gonna take a lot of breaks um, because I'm getting over a, a a bit of a flu. So I'm gonna try to like give myself a second to to let my voice come back. Um, uh, but we're gonna take a five minute break uh, and then we're going to dig into uh, our actual wire sharking. Uh, we're gonna start with that. So uh, three twenty. Oh, sorry. Uh, my I'm I'm Eastern time, so three thirty two my time. Uh, or just take the current time and add five minutes to that, uh, and we'll come back. And, you know, just Matthew's asking if we don't have a VM or home lab set up already, where would you recommend starting? Um, and yeah, YouTube and blogs are both good um, good ways. There you go. Um, there's uh, there's a lot of different ways to get started. Uh, VirtualBox is is free. Um, VMware Workstation Player, I believe, is free. Uh, I would highly recommend VMs, even if you don't do much home labbing or if you're scared of home labbing, because you can do very very simple, straightforward VM stuff. Um, you might be able to get this lab to work uh, on just a normal Windows uh, 10, Windows 11 computer. Um, if you have Nmap running, I did not get around to being able to test it. Uh, let me try to. So the issue typically is that Windows will block Nmap. Um, but Nmap has a, a version of Netcat. Uh, so you might be able to essentially go through this lab uh, with that. Um, yeah, yeah, not a problem. Uh, David, do, re do you recommend VMs over running Linux bare metal? I'm just going to, I'll repeat questions out loud because I'm not sure, uh, if the chat is going to be kept, uh, in the recording. Um, that's a great question. It depends entirely on what you want to do. Um, mm -hmm. I have licenses for, for Visio, for example. Um, so I don't, I don't run Linux bare metal. Uh, cause it's just easier to use on windows. Um, most of the stuff I do in Linux is stuff that's more VM based, um, for my home computer. So I typically run Linux in VMs only, but that is not the case for, uh, everything. If you want to use, um, Linux as a, uh, like as your base operating system, depending on what you do, uh, that can be great. Uh, and it can be more useful than uh, running it in a VM, depending on what, if you if you do a lot of things like what I do, which is uh, I, I, I try to break my virtual machines a lot, or I try to break my Linux stuff a lot, uh, VMs is a lot better because I don't want to break my bare metal stuff. All right. Not a problem. All right, so we've got just a nice little mostly vanilla um, Ubuntu VM running here. Exactly, and as you can see, I've got uh, I've got some snapshots set up. So if, if I break anything, <laughs> we can go back and uh, revert it to to something if we have to. And uh, what I am, do, I have a, a, a setup here where I've got two um, uh, two consoles in a single screen. That's just for you guys to be able to see everything that we're going to do. You can do with just two different consoles. So you got one console here and then one over here. That's perfectly fine. Oh. Um, something you might, depending on how you install Wireshark. Um, you might need to pseudo it because on my, on this particular virtual machine, uh, I only have it set up where you have to be in the pseudo or group to, or you have to be running as root, I believe to capture traffic. Um, so if you, if you have any trouble, uh, you might need to pseudo Wireshark. Uh, I know that's not best practice for, for things in life is to, to just pseudo things. Um, it's probably better to set it up to not need to do that. Uh, but for for the lab purposes, it's in a virtual machine. We're gonna 
so we can get away with it. But don't do that in production. Um, so, so for anybody who's not familiar, um, we've got Wireshark right here. We're going to capture on the any uh, the any device uh, because it's going to give us a little bit more traffic, and that's going to make it a little bit more um, uh, difficult to parse, uh, probably, but um, not too difficult because we're going to do some real simple stuff to start. So, so when when it comes to networking. Also, is is the text on the screen large enough, or do I need to enlarge it? Uh, does anybody is anybody having trouble reading it? Okay, sweet. So when it comes to networking, you've got these different hats, right? And and when you show your IP address um, in Windows with IP config, or in, in Linux with IPA or IF config, um, we can pick some things out, like this IP address right here, one twenty seven zero zero one. Um, which is on our LO um, device. Things that you don't you don't need to know these things. Also, by the way, if anybody has questions, uh, I think people have been pretty good about this, but please ask questions. Uh, this time is for you guys. So I would much rather uh, answer questions that people have uh, and, and get, get good, useful uh, information to people than just go off pre-defined stuff because um, the goal is for this to be useful to you guys. Um, we got another IP address right here because I've got two different um, device network devices going on this thing. And you'll see there's also what it's calling a, a link slash ether address. This is your MAC address. Excuse me. And you'll notice it's interesting. Uh, the the MAC address related to your 127 IP is all zeros. That is because 127, uh, all the way from 127.001 all the way to 127.255.255.255 uh, is a special set of IP addresses. So if I ping any of those, No, 255 is actually worse. This is special. That's a whole other thing. We won't get into that today. All the way up to 254. Um, and, and those octets, if anybody doesn't know, the, the, the numbers in between the dots, they only go up to 255. They don't go up to 999 or something like that. Um, and that's because of the way the computer uh, reads them. Uh, those addresses are on your computer, and they're basically a virtual network connection. So, um, they're what's called the local host, and they resolve to a, a name. So if I ping local host, one word, you'll see that it's returning from 127.001. And this is designed essentially to, to test that your, your IP network is working without having to go out and, and talk to somebody and talk to another computer, actually. Uh, and in the development world, uh, we'll use this for things like setting up a local web server um, to uh, that only we will, we only want to be able to get to on our computer. Uh, and if you guys home lab at all, you might uh, have web servers set up on localhost uh, already. Uh, so if anyone's wondering what localhost is, and we're gonna we're gonna dig into that a little bit in just a moment. So let's let's start our first trace. So this is going to be Pretty much the same thing as the first PCAP, the PCAP one dot PCAP NG in the Discord for anybody who's following along and does not have a VM. Um, we're going to run these commands. We're going to do ncat. Uh, yeah, okay. We're going to do ncat dash L as in Lima 127.0.0.1. And let's go with 45, 45. And when I run that command, you'll see it doesn't look like it's doing anything. And on this other terminal window here, 
we're going to run the same command but without the dash l and we'll see it doesn't look like it's doing anything but let's uh let's type something let's say hello and you'll see it shows up on both of the screens Uh, anybody who's uh, following along with the actual uh, virtual machines able to confirm uh, or deny whether or not something like this is working for you? Because if we missed a if we missed a step here, <laughs> I'd like to check on that. Sweet. So, so this is cool, right? This is a network connection. It's it's connecting over our, our virtual connection, 127.001, right? This virtual IP address that is, it's virtual inside my virtual machine. But if you look on your host computer, uh, your non-virtual machine host computer, you can still ping 127.001 uh, and, and do this exact same thing. You don't actually need a virtual machine for this. A reason I recommend a virtual machine is sometimes your, your local machine uh, will have firewalls set up. We'll, we'll get to that in a minute. So if we want to know what it's actually doing uh, versus just seeing the result, right, which is what we're seeing right now, we're seeing the result of uh, a connection. Uh, we're going to have to actually look at what's going on in, in the Wireshark and, and something in on the IT side. When I put on my IT hat, let's put on a, an actual hat for, for reference. When I put on my IT hat, 99% of the time when I have a ticket that I don't solve within like five or 10 minutes, the best thing that I should have done from the beginning was start a Wireshark trace um, because Wireshark will tell you what's actually going over the network versus just what I think is going over the network. And the easiest way to mess up in IT is to go off what you think is happening versus looking and finding out what's actually happening under the hood. So let's do this. Let's uh, let's open our Wireshark and let's start a, a trace. Start capturing packets, and we're going to do the exact same exercise that we did. We're going to do an NCAT tac L one twenty seven zero point zero point. Let's do zero zero two uh, for fun here, and let's do a different a different number also down here. Forty five forty nine. We'll do forty five forty nine. See, it doesn't look like it's doing anything. And let's connect to that. Oh, I, I used the wrong net cap over there. And let's connect to that one. And let's say hello again. And you'll see I've got this, these packets that are being generated. And also, this might be more similar to PCAP 2 also. My apologies for that. I think PCAP 1 might just be uh, uh, IP, like just pinging stuff. Um, but let's do that too. Let's ping. I, did, I just hit Control-C to close that connection. And you'll see ICMP. All right, Control-C again. Now let's go to Wireshark, stop, uh, and let's finally take a look at our hats. So uh, for anybody, again, who's who's just like a little um, new to Wireshark, there, there's three main screens in Wireshark. You've got your, your packet list screen, which is this top one up here that has all the packets in it. Uh, you've got your packet details screen, um, which is this one here. This is where we're going to spend a lot of our time in the packet details screen today. And at the bottom, you've got packet bytes. Uh, these are literally just the, the hex bytes version of the, the raw stuff that's going over your wire, right? Or in our case, our virtual wire. Um, but let's, let's look at our TCP data right here. Uh, TCP being kind of the main protocol, protocol just being um, a language, essentially, that two different things speak to talk to each other. And 
let's see what it actually did. So we can we can see that the stuff, the packets we generated are are we're all based on 127 uh, addresses here. So we can actually filter for that. See how there's there's some uh, there's some extra stuff that showed up in here. Um like the ARP stuff. But you'll see that that's that's not actually on the same uh, those same IP addresses. We only care about what we were running. So let's filter for that. So in the display filter up top, do an IP dot addr equals equals one twenty seven point zero point zero point. Uh, let's do two because two is the one that we listened on, right? Um. This display filter is really powerful uh, for anybody who uh, wants to dig around in big Wireshark uh, PCAPs. You basically have to learn how to use the display filter. Uh, it's it's going to make your life a lot easier. Chances are most of the PCAPs you get are not going to be you know, 15, 20, 30, 40 packets like, like the ones that we're doing in this lab. Um, and there's, there's a lot of different things you can do. This is a whole uh, sort of pseudo language. Uh, in, in within Wireshark that you can use to filter stuff down to what you actually want to see. And the key with it is anytime you use a dot, chances are you can dot that with something else. So you can do a dot SRC for source. So only things coming from 127.0.0.2 or dot DST or DST, sorry, that's it, for things going to 0 0.0.0.2. But we want just anything that was involved. So we're just going to do uh, .addr. So let's pop open one of these packets. Just uh, We'll do, I guess I'll, I'll look at nine for me. Yours is going to look a little different than mine if you're following along. Um, it's not going to be exactly the same because uh, that's how networking works. Uh, but there's going to be some very strong similarities. And if we pop open this bottom one right here, or actually, let's see, if, there we go. This is a better example. So I would say, look through your packets until you find the one that has something like this in here, or whatever you typed into your netcat, um, a human readable sentence. You'll see there's, there's packet bytes in there. Um, now, if you look at your, your packet details screen, which is the middle screen right here, you'll see you've got your data right here. And that data, if you click on it, highlights what is going on. This is what we actually sent. This is the data we care about, right? And what's on top of that data? Hats. The data has a TCP hat, an IP hat, and then what it's calling a Linux cook capture hat and a frame hat. So when we were going through the slides, remember we were talking about how uh, you've got these kind of three main hats that different network devices care about. You've got your, your IP hat, which is uh, a packet. This is the packet hat right here. It has information like your source, destina or source and destination IP addresses. You'll see by default, um, it was pinging from 127.0.0.1 to, uh, even though we were selecting 127.0.0.2, as our destination, it was saying, let's, you know, let's do that. Or I guess we're, uh, this one wasn't for ping. This was for our, our net cat. And TCP here has a source and a destination port. And that number, that 4549 that we put in there is our destination port. That is your segment hat, right? That is the thing that says, uh, this is the actual process on the computer that is going to receive uh, the information. Uh, so not just the computer itself, which was 127.0.0.2, but the actual process on the computer, which was netcat. So that command we ran earlier, netcat 127.0.0.2.45.49 is saying this IP address, this port, is what our computer is listening to on this process and NCAT being a process or NETCAT being a process. And the TAC L or dash L right here is short for listen, 
which is why we didn't use it on the left side. On the left side, we were saying netcat connect to 127.002, 4549. And if we try that again, but we put a different port in here, 4547, or, or let's put, you know, 50,000. It'll refuse a connection because it's only caring about 4549. Because that port number is how Netcat is deciding uh, what traffic goes to it versus what traffic goes to something else. And when you connect to most websites, what's happening is those websites are running on a computer and they have a process that's listening on port 443 nowadays, right? Or port 80 historically uh, for HTTP. Uh, but HTTPS, all it's saying is I've got a process on my web server that when someone tries to connect to me and connects to my IP address, if it connects to port 443, I'm going to send it vetsec.com, right? Or, or vetseccon.com or .org, right? So what about that, that frame, that, uh, that layer two address? You'll notice there's not really a whole lot in here about that. It's it's a uh, it's kind of a, just a weird mishmash, um, and that is because well there we go Linux code capture is where it's it's set everything. But you'll see it has that source that source address here in this hat is that 0 .0 .0 0 0.0.0.0 address, which if you remember from earlier. was related to our 127 address. So, so this is the downside of using your loopback addresses for things. Because your loopback address works really good for, for showing uh, IP addresses, right? Because that's what it's designed for stuff on the IP level. But if you want to dig around in, in frames, which is the hat that sits on top of an IP address, you're not going to get a whole lot of information uh, that, that's real out of, out of your, your, uh, uh, your 127 addresses. So, uh, and the reason for that, uh, there's, there's a few different reasons for that. Uh, so let's do a second PCAP. Actually, let's take another quick break. Uh, trying to do a Pomodoro style here. And yeah, just give everybody a second. Um, we'll do a six minute break. So that'll be four oh one Eastern. All right, yeah. So we'll do a six minute break. Um, any questions or comments, please toss them in the chat. Um, I'm gonna go uh, get some more water and uh, we'll talk to you guys all in six minutes. Alrighty, welcome everybody back. David says, you mentioned home network labs. When you get back, I'd appreciate hearing your thoughts on resources to reach out to work on adding that to his experience. So home networking is is interesting. Networking traditionally is is not something that <clears throat> uh, it's it's hard to get uh, real networking experience in a home environment unless you go really crazy. Um, traditionally, 
uh, because a lot of the stuff that makes networking kind of um, like enterprise networking, enterprise networking is, is having enormous amounts of throughput, things that most people don't have at home. That being said, um, you can purchase, you know, old Cisco routers and switches on eBay and stuff. And people do it all the time uh, to, to, to learn on. Um, you can uh, do a lot of stuff uh, nowadays virtually uh, with uh, programs like GNS3 uh, and uh, even uh, Packet Tracer. So Cisco Packet Tracer uh, is one that I, I recommend to everybody. I will put a link to it in the chat. So you have to sign up for a Cisco account, I believe. Um, but Packet Tracer is it's, it's free and it lets you build out uh, a simulated network um, as big as you want to make it, um, as, as crazy as you want to make it. And, and it's, uh, it's pretty robust. It, it has limitations that historically um, you could say it'll get you easily to uh, like a CCNA level, uh, which is uh, Cisco's associate level networking uh, certification. Um, you can learn a lot with Packet Tracer alone. Now, things are getting interesting with the, the SDN, Software Defined Networking. Um, there's stuff like Mininet, which lets you build uh, a Software Defined Network. I don't know why they're still running HTTP, um, but they're still running HTTP. Um, or maybe it's something wrong with my computer. Um, but Mininet lets you build out uh, an open flow uh, software defined network on a virtual machine. Uh, and then the one that I've recently been getting into, which uh, this might be a hint to the challenge slightly. So also my voice is going to start cracking um, a lot. Uh, so I apologize if uh, anybody is sensitive to uh, high pitched noises. Uh, FR router is a, a Linux based tool, a Linux based software defined router uh, that is uh, uses very similar commands to like a Cisco router. Uh, and the what it what it lets you do is uh, essentially build out an again, a network, but virtually, uh, you can put it on a VM, um, you can play around with it. Um, those are those would be my three recommendations to poke around with to start. Um, Mininet and Packet Tracer pretty easy to get going. FR router is a little more complicated. Uh, I am working on a, on a personal project to kind of make that a little easier to play with uh, myself. Um, but that's a personal project, and it, it'll probably take a very long time for it to be uh, super usable, especially for for people who are, are new to things. Um, but I recommend for sure Packet Tracer and Mininet to start, and then. Once you get to a point where Mininet and Packet Tracer are no longer meeting uh, what you want to learn, that's when it, it might be worth looking into uh, you know, getting physical equipment. Uh, hopefully by then you already have a job doing something related as well though. So let's pop open our uh, virtual machine again. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, David. And we are going to pull up our terminal again. And keep remember, so my, my virtual machine and your virtual machine, if you're following along, it's going to have that, that loopback address. Um, and unless you did something really weird with it, it's also going to have uh, a virtual address like 192.168.254.131, which is, is mine, uh, 192.168.254.131. So that address is, it's still a virtual address because it's on a VM, right? But the difference is it's not loopback. So a loopback address, it, it exists kind of, it's, the imagined is not the right word, right? Uh, it's real. You can actually do things with it. Uh, but a loopback address never actually leaves your computer, even virtually. Um, if you try to ping 127.001, you're going to always get your computer. You're never going to get my 127.001. Uh, and vice versa. Whereas uh, even virtually speaking, 
I can ping one uh, one nine two one six eight two five four one three one from a different virtual machine if it's in the same uh, basically the same local area network. Um, I can set that virtual machine so that I could ping it from my, my phone uh, in another room. And you can use this address for that. Um, abstracting away some details there. Generally speaking, all you need to care about is this is, an, this is a, a real address. You could actually use it from a different computer. Um, we're, we're not gonna do that. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna do it from our computer. Uh, but we're gonna run another netcat here. And then, uh, let's see. So we need oh, and cat listen one on two one six eight two five four one three one. Oh, should specify what port we want to listen on. I forget what the default net cat port is, but we're Again, we're not going to get to that. There's tools you can use to find out what stuff is listening on. Uh, let's pick a port. Let's do uh, 9001. Also, if anyone's wondering, your ports go up to, I believe it's 65,535, um, which is a factoid that you can use at parties, and people will think you're very cool. So if we connect, we can say, sorry, hi, and let's see, bad at, I'm bad at test data. Sorry, so you'll see one, one, one thing that's probably worth pointing out even though I'm sending the data over the network, like over this virtual network, um, it's it's not treating it like the shell. Uh, the shell doesn't see it and, and actually exit or, or clear the screen the way that if I actually type on the screen, right? Um, which is something we're actually going to do in a, a little bit of a, the way that this will tie into cybersecurity on our third exercise. Um, but uh, let's do that one more time. Again, I, I kind of forgot to uh, uh, do our Wireshark there. But we're going to capture Wireshark packets um, again. So start capture packets um, top top left right here. And you'll see nothing going over it right now because I don't, I don't have any other network traffic. Um, but we'll do it again. Netcat, listen, 192.168.254.131.9001, or whatever your address is, right? Just not your 127 address, whatever address uh, your computer has other than that. And we're going to connect to that on our other terminal. And we're going to say, hello world. And it's probably worth pointing out, uh, you can send this both ways. So both sides of the connection are, are able to talk to each other. Again, let's, uh, let's see what's going on under the hood. Something is wrong. Oh, it's, uh, that's what it was, I... I, I, I still have the display filter on. So this, so this is something that you'll, you'll get confused in Wireshark again as well for anybody who's new to it. Um, there's different kinds of filters in Wireshark. There's capture filters and display filters. Um, so I had the right capture filter on, which was any, but I still had that IP dot address 127.001. Even though I cleared it out, um, sometimes just clicking, you know, whatever. Uh, so let's be honest, right? So if you do that, just clearing it out is not enough. You'll see it, it turns into gray up there, but it still has the filter. So you have to actually click the X on the right side to, to show your new stuff. So now we can see we have this uh, this this cool new um, IP traffic here.
Uh, so let's filter it again. We only want one three worth. Um, let's do a, a shortcut. So if you right click it, uh, apply as filter selected, you'll see it gives the option to IP source 192.168.254.131, which is exactly what we want. So we can do that. And we filtered our traffic down. This is, in my opinion, probably the easiest way to learn um, the Wireshark language stuff. If you find something that's interesting, say you only want something that's frame number 17, you can apply that as filter. You can do not that stuff. You can do that stuff, that stuff, and whatever other filters you have, or and not, or not. Um, standard logic operators, which some of you guys might be familiar with. Um, and are really valuable to learn as you as you kind of uh, do more with it, do more with IT. Recommend uh, playing around in Wireshark, seeing what you can filter, what you can't filter. There's not a lot that you can't filter. So again, if we kind of look through this, we can find some packet bytes. We can find our hello world here. And also, if anyone's curious, uh, this is the problem with HTTP without the S. Um, anybody who's looking can literally see everything you send in your packets over the network without HTTPS. So uh, anytime you go to a site that doesn't have the S on the end, uh, everything is going over that network. Uh, so what do we want to actually look at here, though? Let's find our data packet. Here we go. So we've got our data, right? Our important stuff, the stuff we actually care about, you know, like your users actually care about. And it's hello world down here, just like it was before. And we've got the hats on here. But this time, our Linux cook capture... is actually not any different. Um, so that that probably is, is just not going to change because of the way the virtual machine uh, works. It's, it's not going to use the actual uh, MAC address there. We'd have to talk to it from a, a different computer, which could do. Um, it's a little outside of scope. It's, it's outside of what uh, we're trying to do today. So we'll, we'll hold off on that. Um, but basically, if you start capturing on one machine and um, playing around, having your virtual machines try to talk to each other, and then you look through the packets like this, uh, you'll be able to see different things. Uh, and you'll be able to see how that is actually working. So one, one thing that we did a little bit differently this time though, right, was we, we talked both directions, right? Um, so if we look at our uh, history here, I believe not much is what we sent. Not much. So this one, you'll see it has the source and destination ports swapped. And we can find that it's in, in, it's in the top part of the hat here, right? But it also has its own little tiny sub hats, source and destination. So we, we set the source port or we set the destination port to 9001. Um, but what you'll, what you'll see, what happens is you're going to, talk to that from a random port on your computer. Um, and it's it's usually gonna be, unless there's something weird going on, uh, what we call ephemeral ports, <clears throat> excuse me, which are ports that are above a certain number. I believe it's in the, in the thousands range. Uh, so anytime you see these high port numbers, uh, that's usually gonna be the, the client in a client server connection. That's gonna say we're, we're talking to port 9001. Um, but then when the server wants to talk back to you, then obviously your source and destination stop uh, or switch, just like with an IP address. Um, difference is you, you've got a, um, a process that's connected as a client, just like you got the process connected as the, as the server, right? So just like in our, in our, when we're talking about the HTTPS server, like the web server from earlier that you're talking to over port 443, when that, when that computer's talking back to you, 
it's using a port like this, 3610, or some other random port that is picked. And it's saying, that's the port we're talking to. So um, we're going to do just one more, again, real, real, real simple lab. But this one, we're going to do a reverse shell. Um, are there people in here who don't know what a reverse shell is? All right, I'm going to assume everybody knows what a reverse shell is. Um, well, I guess actually, since this, since this is being recorded. Uh, so a reverse shell is when you go onto a computer uh, or when you're when you're you're hacking a computer, and you essentially are bringing the shell, uh, the shell, which is like a terminal, back to uh, the the hacker, right, or the uh, the attacker, so that they can run commands on on your remote computer. It's the short version. Um, it's similar to a a normal shell, but but different. So in a normal shell. If I want to SSH, um, you know, connect to, you know, computer at address. Um, a reverse shell actually takes the the target computer and it shells back to you, um, so you you can get the shell onto that computer in, in different ways. Um, and you'd think that, you know, when we when we do our netcat commands. Um, I can't, I can't run standard, you know, Linux commands because even though it's sending them over the network, it does, it's not catching them with a process that is a shell. So it would have to talk to a, sh uh, a shell process like bash or PowerShell or, or command prompt or zish uh, in order to make that command actually do something. All right. So none of, none of these kinds of commands are going to actually do anything. Whereas if, you know, if I just run it here, It'll tell me. So the reason we picked this particular version of netcat is that it has a parameter tech e, um, and we can actually tell it to talk to bash. Uh, so I guess this well this wasn't technically going to be a reverse shell. This will be just a, a normal show. But now if we connect and we send something over that network, it's going to tell us, oh, or it's going to show us that data. So what does, what does that look like? And, and again, like, this is this is a little bit on the uh, this is very repetitive. We're, we're we're doing the same thing over and over again. The idea is any of this stuff you can actually look in Wireshark and dig around and figure it out. Uh, any of these individual uh, ha hats, right? You can you can look at that hat. You can look at a port. You can look at TCP segment len. You can copy that, you can Google it, and you can figure out what's actually going on under the hood piece by piece here. So if, if you're going to, you know, you want to figure out what a flag is, you can search, you know, what is a flag in Wireshark? What, you know, what's a flag in TCP um, or, or push? What does the push flag do? What, what do these things do? And you can dig around and again, just piece by piece, actually start to figure out what's going on under the hood. And because you have these discrete little tiny sections that you can, it's already broken out for you to be able to say, oh, okay, this is what's going on here. 90% of the time when you're troubleshooting or you're doing, you know, incident response, a lot of that information is not going to be useful to you. But once you actually understand what it is and what is useful and what's normal versus like, well, why are these flags set? You know, uh, that's when it becomes really valuable and really powerful.
so real quickly, uh, let's do our final little uh, our, our test here. So we're going to uh, capture packets again, and we're going to capture that shell. So we'll run our who am I. And we'll see we got a bunch of packets from that. And let's do an LS. And let's do a get some get some device information. And we'll close that connection. We'll pause our packet capture. And we'll see again that we've got a whole bunch of data right here. And if you look through the packet bytes on the bottom screen, you can see things like, who am I, Sam, LS. Now you'll notice what you don't see here is the smoking gun of uh, you know bin slash bash or anything like that saying, ah, it's hooked into the bash program. You're seeing the results, not the not the you know the the stuff that's making the network traffic. So this is a limitation of Wireshark uh, because, and, and a limitation of, of doing network analysis is, is you have to understand you have to have an idea of what's actually sending stuff over the network uh, in order to understand what your network traffic is contextually. Um, now. Is that is that a bad thing, or I mean, it's it's just a thing. Uh, but you'll you'll be able to understand better what your processes are trying to do over the network again by understanding the network traffic. Um, sometimes you, if you know, you know enough about stuff, you can do a little bit of reverse engineering trying to figure out what it's doing. Uh, as an example, uh, I had to troubleshoot uh, some VoIP issues a while back, and uh, I didn't really know what was going on, but I was able to look through packet bytes and see that it was throwing a, a weird header. Um, you know, one of these little fields was saying something that it shouldn't say. So, uh, without getting into specifics, because I can't, um, I was I was able to identify how to to change that header in in the actual program, so that uh, I was able to actually uh, have my customers call uh, call each other. Um, but the only way I was able to do that was by digging around Wireshark because it wasn't enough just to know what was going on uh, in the process uh, on the uh, uh, on the server. Uh, I was I was able to see what the server was uh, saying it was sending, but I had to go into Wireshark. I had to go into actually capturing network traffic to see what was actually happening. So let's let's just review a little bit. Um, like I said at the beginning, this is a a very simple, you know, level one uh, networking thing. But but the the crux of the idea, and I know we're slotted for a lot longer than we actually um, had here, uh, or than we actually have. We're we're not going to go much longer at all. Um, is that when you take these individual um pieces of of a complex system you can learn a lot and figure it out over the course of time and and really all you need is patience the patience to actually figure out when i go into a packet what each of these hats is actually doing what each of them actually says about my data right or about where my data is going or what it's doing. If you can do that and you can have the patience to figure that out, you can pretty much learn anything uh, with networks. And, and this is the, this skill set is the one that it doesn't matter whether you're using software defined networking. It doesn't matter whether you're, you're, you're being, uh, like a network engineer, network admin, or a SOC analyst, or, or or any of those jobs, 
what matters is if you if you can understand this part of networking, this is valuable across the fields. Even if you're in uh, like GRC, right? If you're if you're a non-technical or or, or an, not doing a super technical job, not that GRC isn't necessarily uh, technical non-technical, but if you're doing something like that, and you have to talk to to network engineers, right, a about securing their software. Uh, you don't necessarily need to know uh, that, you know, the, the specific Cisco commands to, to enable uh, MAC address stickying, right? But if you can understand the language here, the language of what's actually going on with packets and what's going on with your MAC address, your IP address, all that other stuff, that is when you uh, you're going to be able to have a conversation that uh, maybe uh, is not hostile, right? Um, which is a, is a problem that I've seen uh, in, in my, my side of the house is a lot of the times there's a divide between uh, implementers and uh, enforcers in, in cybersecurity, right? The, the guys uh, and the folks who are trying to implement something are not being told things that are that are actually how uh, actually related to what's actually going on under the hood. And again, that's that's true across the board, but networking is is particularly uh, problematic, I think, because uh, a lot of people are very scared to learn networking. But at the end of the day, all it is, is looking at the headers, looking at what they actually do, and and understanding what's going on there. And, and Google is your friend, right? You're, you're going to be able to find tons of documentation on Wikipedia, on uh, Stack Overflow and Reddit and all that stuff about this stuff. Um, one, one other really useful tool, uh, which I'm assuming most of you guys probably already are familiar with, um, but that's an assumption, uh, is an RFC. Uh, this stands for request for comments, which is uh, probably a bad name, but uh, these are the guys who actually build out the internet uh, stuff, right? They say, hey, this is how the internet should work. Um, whether or not it actually does work that way is, is arguable. But it's a technical documentation saying, uh, hey, this is how uh, these IP addresses should work. Or this is how these MAC addresses should work. And these are a great way to fall asleep uh, if you're if you're not familiar with them. There's a small subset of people who find them fascinating to read, um, which is great. Uh, if you're one of those people, that's awesome. Um, but uh, those will have information on the implementation of what's you know what why is there you know an ACK flag in the in the TCP header in the TCP hat why does it have this this thing or that thing right there you go yeah so so you'll need to learn RFCs um, for for uh, if you want to have a uh, a career in in networking um, if you want to have a career in uh, anything related to networking it, it will not hurt to learn uh, RFCs and to learn how to read them and, and understanding that uh, sometimes that's the only way you're going to be able to figure out uh, what the network traffic is, why the network traffic is doing what it is, uh, and that'll help you solve your problems. Or why, um, you know, malicious traffic, you'll be able to figure out like, oh, that's not what this is supposed to look like because it's doing something that is really much what the RFC is saying, you shouldn't do this. All right, so we're gonna take uh, another quick break, quick break. And um, what I'm gonna do is, yeah, another five minute break. And then we're going to do a sort of a wrap up, but it'll be, since we do have extra time, um, what I'm gonna do is, 
give people a shot at uh, working on the challenge PCAP um, with it in in the in in the uh, in the uh, the seminar room uh, or, or session room um, and talking about it uh, if anybody is has started working on that so we're gonna do that um, and I'm gonna come back and give you guys some pointers if you want them um, I know some people like just doing that stuff on their own totally cool do that as well um, but I will we'll, we'll wrap up first so I'll, I'll, I'll do some closing thoughts um, but we'll do that at 4 30. Eight local, which is Eastern. And be right back to uh, wrap up the uh, me talking section. So, um, right, so, so conclusion, <laughs> more or less. When, whenever you're uh, gonna dig around in network stuff, this is, this is, this is all it is. It's, a set of, of packets. Sometimes it's broken up into, you know, a bunch of different ones. Sometimes it's all in one, depending on how complicated the traffic you're looking at. Usually it's broken up into different packets. And you've got data. Like we have in this, this, this particular stream here. And then you've got information about that data. Hacks the data is where that do different things. They say, this is the IP address. They say, this is the port. And this is the, you know, this is when it was sent. This is uh, where, where it's going uh, and on different levels. Um, this is how long, uh, you know, how many hops it can jump through is what time to live talks about. And, and each of these things, you can boil them down into their their core components do research on just those and what you'll start to see is that it's complex it's complex but it's not complicated as long as you can do that as long as you can break it down into okay this is just a hat that the data wears to get through a certain area back to our, our terrible social engineering example from earlier um your data just wears uh, an IP hat to get through the router, right? So, so to tell the so the router gives him a thumbs up and says, "All right, go through this door." He wears that hat that says IP address on it. Um, or or to get through uh, a switch, you wear your frame hat that has MAC addresses on it and and some other little bits of information. Um, or or to get to your host and to tell your host. Hey, this is where I'm going. Um, legitimate traffic or illegitimately traffic, right? Uh, it, it's going to wear a hat saying, hey, this is where you should send me. Um, whether you're looking at network attacks or whether you're looking at legitimate traffic, um, that's what it's doing. And when you dig around and look at the network traffic, you're seeing what, what the stuff is actually doing. Does it get way more complex than anything we did here? Yes, 100%. Um, if you look at any kind of encrypted network traffic, you're not going to see a whole lot of information. Um, there's a, a new-ish protocol called Quick that encrypts even some of the some of the lower level stuff or some of the stuff here that uh, isn't data. That doesn't make it more complicated. It makes it more complex, but it's it still can be broken down again into just all right. Well, what is each individual little piece of it doing. And, and that might seem uh, trite. Uh, that might seem like something that's really obvious. But I think it's something that people are scared of because networking can seem like this really complicated thing that you're never going to understand. But that's that's all it is. It's how, how does it get over the wire? There's some different rules. Um, uh, there's different needs than uh, stuff that's talking within a computer. 
Um, but at the end of the day, that's, that's all it is. It's just, what do we put on this data to get it from this place to this place? Um, what does it need to get from this place to this place? So um, again, I, I apologize for, for the, the session being a little shorter than, uh, you know, the full, um, or a lot shorter than the full time. Hopefully uh, you guys don't hold it against me. Um, but uh, that's sort of what the, the challenge PCAP is there is, is for as well. Um, so it's, it's an opportunity for you guys to take, you know, hopefully what, uh, whatever amount of, of Wireshark you already know um, and, and try to apply it and try to say, um, this is, uh, you know, uh, this is something I can break down, look into, um, figure out, uh, I'll, I'm not, you know, move, move to the next level or, or, or learn a, a new trick or, or two in here. So that's, that's really all I have. Um, uh, it's, you know, don't be afraid to, to, to break this stuff down and look at it just like you would any other, anything else in, in IT or anything else in, in life. You know, look at, look at the fundamental pieces of it uh, and build it out. Um, so yeah, again, uh, look at the challenge, um, uh, shoot, shoot a message to me. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, shoot a message to me if you figure, figure the flag out and I will, I will send you a meme, um, message me on Discord or, or LinkedIn or anything like that. Um, yeah, uh, I will leave the session up. Um, and if anybody does have, have questions about that, um, uh, if, yeah, if anybody does have questions about that, uh, I'll put them, um, or, or I'll, 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 I'll keep trying to answer. Um, and yeah, that's, uh, that's all I got. So thank you guys so much.